Tanaka, Miyak de Lesson George Warren, Ye Katapare, Ye Islare, Ye Kampitsa Wachahare. Hi, my name is Dalesson George Warren, but everyone calls me Ru. I'm a citizen of Catawba Indian Nation, or as we call ourselves, the people of the river, and I work as an artist and teacher. I'm employed by the Catawba Cultural Preservation Project, which is the tribal entity charged with protecting, preserving, promoting, and maintaining the rich cultural heritage of the Catawba Indian Nation. I work with people of all ages, both tribal and non-tribal, to talk about history, food sovereignty, language revitalization. And today, really briefly, I want to run through some of the myths and misconceptions about Catawbas. A recent study by the First Nations Development Institute found that over 70% of US citizens believe that they got inadequate or inaccurate information from their schooling system about Native Americans. Another study found that upwards of 90% of all textbooks in the US don't mention anything about Native Americans after 1900. Um, th these are both problems because if people don't know about us and don't know the kind of problems that we're dealing with, um, how are we able to advocate for ourselves? Plus, for our children who are going through the schooling system, how does it make them feel? How do they relate to education when they don't see themselves, their people, or their stories in school curricula? So I want to go through and point out a few really important dates and moments in Catawba history, um, point you towards some re resources and references that you can use to bring into the classroom, um, both historical texts and source materials. So probably the first moment um, that you'd want to talk about in a classroom is the moment that Catawbas and other tribes in what is now South Carolina and North Carolina first met Europeans. So that year was 1540. Um, the European that we met was Hernandez Soto and his men. They were explicitly looking for gold, and so they came and visited our village. Um, the story is very, very interesting about what happened there, leading to a kidnapping of the leader of the community, the Lady of Kofotecheki, who was actually a woman. So, you know, imagine their surprise of finding out that a woman's in charge of a village um, here, here in the quote-unquote New World, right? So that was our first experience with Europeans, and it didn't go so well. After that, there's not a lot of mention of Catalas in the historical record until the late 1600s going into the 1700s. Um, by this time, we start making a strong relationship with Charleston or Charlestown, um, mostly through trade of skins um, and other materials from farther inland that we would either get by hunting ourselves or by trading with other tribes that were even farther inland than we were. Uh, in the early 1700s, you also saw a group of journalists and explorers who were coming through the interior of what is now South Carolina and writing down what they saw there. One example would be John Lawson, who kept a really detailed journal of his visit uh, to Catawba land and to other tribes. And so that's a great resource uh, if you want to look at some source materials to see how Europeans were seeing Catawbas when they were first coming here. Now, in the early part of the 1700s, Catawbas start seeing that there's a lot of encroachment onto their land by settlers. You know, as the land towards the coast starts getting filled up and taken over more by wealthy landowners, um, a lot of the poorer settlers had to keep moving inwards and inwards and inwards. And as they did, they kept infringing on Catawba land and other land. So Catawba's concerned about this, decided that they needed to make an agreement or a treaty with the Crown of England. The first of those was in the 1750s. Um, and another one would happen in the 1760s. And those treaties were negotiated primarily by Chief Hagler or King Hagler. Um, he, this is a person who is really, really important to Catawba culture and identity today. Um, our pottery has Chief Hagler motifs on it and heads. Um, so that's another great way of seeing how culture and history can kind of interact with each other. Chief Hagler was notable because um, even though his name in Catawba is Hopkehe, he himself got the name King Hagler because he was so good at haggling or haggling with the crown. And so one really great example of this is when he visits the governor of North Carolina in the 1750s. And in that meeting, uh, the governor of North Carolina is talking about all these things that he's mad at Catawba's for. And at the end of the, the talk, Chief Hagler says, well, here are some of the things that we don't like. And one of the things he mentions is how the colonial government keeps selling alcohol to Catawbas and other tribes for a reduced cost. Um, he saw this as a big problem and actually the source for a lot of the tension that was happening between settlers and Native Americans. This was often called the first temperance speech in what becomes the United States. Um, so it's also a great example of talking about historical trends uh, and, and looking 
at some, again, some source documents. And those are things that you can find really easily online by searching for Chief Hagler uh, and North Carolina Governor. After this period, we've, we've pretty much established 250,000 square acres of land that the Crown has promised to us. Um, but by the 17, uh, 1776, when the Revolutionary War was happening, the Tabas, for some reason, are a lot more interested in siding with the Patriots than the Crown. Um, there's some theories about why that might have happened. One reason might be that they had had such little luck working with the colonial government, they thought maybe siding with their neighbors, the Patriots, would, would actually work for them. So during the Revolutionary War, the Tabas um, fought alongside the Patriots, particularly as scouts, because we knew the landscape so well, right? Spending thousands and thousands and thousands of years on the land, you get to know it pretty well. So during the early part of the Revolutionary War, particularly the Battle of Kings Mountain, um, the Tabas were really crucial, so crucial that after the Revolutionary War, when George Washington was doing his tour of uh, the new United States, right, the 13 states. He specifically visits the Catawbas to thank them for their hand in the Revolutionary War. And then he writes in his journal, for some reason, the Catawbas are concerned that their land is going to be taken away, right? So even in the late 1700s, Catawbas know that this is a real threat to them. Fast forward a little bit further um, to after the Revolutionary War, and the Catawbas again are really worried about how can they keep their land in trust, right? They have these treaties with the colonial government, with the uh, royal crown in England, but they don't have any agreements with this new government called the United States. So they're trying to decide how they can protect their land that way. So they do what they traditionally did, which is they bring everyone together into a room, um, not a room, but <laughs> around a fire, and um, they have a discussion, right? Everyone voices their opinions, they talk about it, pros and cons. And what they eventually decided to do was put a big parcel of land uh, into a land title, right? And that land title said that, because you couldn't just have the Catawba Indians on a land title, you had to have specific people. And so if you look at the land title, it says that the land is under the ownership of Sally New River and other women of the Catawba Indian Nation. This is one of the first times, if not the first time, uh, in the United States that women are holding land. And that's right here, just across the river from York County in Lancaster County. So that's an amazing piece of, of US history that doesn't really get talked about much at all. Um, and it's also a traditional uh, Catawba value. Traditionally, Catawbas are matriarchal, matrilineal, so women hold a lot of power, specifically power over what happens to, to land, to homes, uh, to gardens and farms. Um, so, so they have this land title, they have some treaties, they're not sure if it's going to be respected. And so throughout the early 1800s, more settlers move into the land. The, the government of South Carolina won't stop the settlers from moving in, even though they promised to. And so as the Catawbas are being encroached on, the settlers stop paying rent. There's almost no money coming into the tribe. The Catawbas have almost no hunting land left and almost no agricultural land left. So starvation was definitely a possibility um, by the time we get to 1840. And so in 1840, South Carolina uh, negotiates a treaty with the Catawba in which all of the land uh, that the Catawbas had was taken away. Now that treaty was illegal ab initio from the very beginning because the Constitution says very explicitly that only the federal government can make treaties with tribes. Uh, in the Constitution, tribes and foreign governments are considered on the same level, right? And so South Carolina can't make a treaty with the Catawbas in the same way that South Carolina cannot make a treaty with France. So this is another great way of kind of investigating the Constitution, how the Constitution set up the government, the separation between the states and the federal system, and what that means for relationships with tribes. Now, after 1840, um, some Catawbas went up to the Cherokee uh, area to hang out with the Cherokee. It did not work out well, and so they came back down. And in response, uh, South Carolina gave about 600 square acres of land back to the tribe to be held in trust by the state. And that is where our reservation is today, uh, where I'm sitting right now inside of our tribal government building. So during the last part of the 1800s, Catawbas again are trying to figure out how do we get our rights, how do we get our land, how do we protect ourselves, how do we feed ourselves. Uh, and there were a lot of strategies for that. One strategy was sending children um, off to get an education. Uh, this is also the period of the board, Indian boarding school system. Um, for the most part, a lot of people had horrific experiences at boarding schools. Typically, children would be taken away from their families without consent. Um, they would be moved hundreds of miles away. They'd be stripped their clothes, um, washed in their scalding water, given new itchy clothes. 
And then if they, in the school, if they spoke their language, uh, a lot of the time they'd be beaten. If they practiced their religion, they'd be beaten. Um, and so this was a really traumatic experience for generations and generations and generations of Native Americans. It was also a really damaging experience because, of course, we'd always been educating our children, just maybe not in a way that the United States government or Europeans thought was appropriate. And so when our children got taken away, um, the transmission of language, the transmission of culture and song and knowledge about the world um, was, was really weakened through that. Now, the experience for Catawas at boarding schools was a little bit different than the experience of other tribes. By this period of time, Catawas knew when you're not around Catawas, don't speak the Catawas language, don't talk about religion. Um, and so they knew how to survive the boarding school system. But still, having to watch other children being beaten at a boarding school will surely have some kind of effect. So the boarding school system is actually a really great way of diving into some of the ways that the United States was trying to take over tribal land, um, trying to assert its control over tribal peoples. And there's a lot of great writing that's been done on it, some for adults and actually some for children as well. Um, Dr. Debbie Reese, who runs the blog Native Americans in Children's Literature, uh, maintains a long list of books and resources uh, that, are, that are factual, that represent Native Americans in a great way and that are appropriate for various ages. So that's another great resource to go to if you want children to be able to, to kind of get an idea of what that boarding school system was like. Now, by the turn uh, of the 1900s, Catawba started advocating for citizenship. By this time, we are still not citizens of the United States, despite the fact that we preceded uh, the United States and even preceded all the colonies, right? And so Catawba started advocating really hard for citizenship, and we didn't gain federal citizenship until 1924. Um, that date was significant because it was right after World War I, and Native Americans to this day have the highest per capita enrollment in the military. And so the president at the time said, well, you know, they, they sacrificed this much for the country, we need to just make them citizens across the board. Some tribes did not want this, other tribes like the Tabas did want this. Um, this is another great way of looking into World War I, World War II history, specifically with the code talkers and how essential their role was uh, in, in the winning of those two world wars. So that's another great resource to look into. And again, there's lots of writing that's been done on those people. Now in the 40s, we actually regained some of our land through a new relationship with the federal government. This relationship is referred to as recognition, and that means the United States government views itself as having a nation-to-nation -nation relationship with a tribe. Things started to look up. We had more land than we had had in almost 100 years, more than 100 years. Uh, we had recognition from the federal government. We were receiving some of the things that we had been promised in our treaties before, so we actually had resources to do things we needed to do. But in 1954, the United States passed a new law called the Indian Termination Act. Uh, which sounds really dramatic, and it was really dramatic. It's where uh, the United States could send an Indian agent down to a reservation, and if they could get a group of people, it wouldn't even have to be a democratic representation of the tribe, but any group of people to agree to it, then the United States would cease uh, their relationship with the tribe, essentially terminating the tribe, saying that they no longer existed. That's what happened to us in 1959. Indian agents came down, they had a meeting of about 20 people, um, so absolutely not a representative group of Catawas. They said, don't you want to be able to get out from under the foot of the federal government? Don't you want to be able to sell your land so you can feed your family? And for Catawas who were on the verge of starvation, that was of course really appealing. And so the group of people in that room decided to, to vote for termination. At the same time, though, there were other Catawas who were saying, no, this is horrible, we will not do this, we are a people, we must stay together. And so in the 70s, the 1970s, um, the termination was existing throughout the 60s and into the 70s, and then weirdly, Richard Nixon, of all presidents, um, was kind of the one who turned around uh, Indian policy from termination, which it had been for the last 20 years, to a new era of what's called self-determination. That if we want to solve the problems in Indian country, we must allow tribes to take the lead on that. So when we saw this happening, we said this is our opportunity to regain our federal recognition and also to finally settle uh, that 1840 treaty in which our land was taken. So from the 70s all the way up until 1993, Catawbas were fighting for the recognition back. We did it through the Supreme Court and we did it through Congress. Eventually, we got it back through an act of Congress that was signed into law by Bill Clinton in 1993, October 1993. So within my lifetime, we became a federally recognized tribe once again. 
Since then, we've worked really hard to make new programs, education programs, family services, cultural programs, and I believe that uh, Elizabeth Harris, Emily Harris, and Melissa Harris are going to tell you a little bit more about about that stuff. So, hello. If you have any other questions, uh, please feel re free feel free to reach out to me at roo at cccpcrafts.com um, or just call our center Monday through Friday. Hello, and have a great day.